three, four months ago, and I thought it was really good, and so we've invited her to speak to us. Uh, I think you're going to find this a very interesting talk. Maria uh, got her undergraduate and graduate degrees. Master's degree. Master's degree from URI in textile conservation, and she's the person at the Naval War College and also at the Barnum that's doing the conservation efforts. Wow. So here you go. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I guess I don't really need to talk very loudly. Um, with this and my good for sound over there, Mr. Cameraman. Okay, good, you nodded. Um, so my name is Maria Vasquez. I'm a textile conservator. I work for the Naval War College Museum, um, but I am also vice president of the Barnum Memorial Armory in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. And um, I am also a textile conservator there. Uh, because when you work for a small museum, you wear many hats. <laughs> Turn on my little clicker. Oh, don't decide to not work now. Oh, <laughs> Oh, okay, what's happening? It's clicking, it's clicking through my slides, but it's not clicking through those slides. There you go. Um, I don't know, I don't know, hold on. <laughs> it's giving me three seconds. by the Barnum Continentals uh, and essentially has been a museum the entirety uh, of its existence. Um, essentially people came back from World War I and just put their items that they got from World War I and they had themselves on display in the museum and um, it's, we, have, we still have an original display from 1914 that they put in the museum. We sort of uh, fixed things up so they weren't quite hanging by wires or anything, but essentially it's that one case is the same exhibit it's been since 1914. Um, the House, uh, the Barnum um, Armory opens once a month for tours, and also um, yeah, by to uh, you can get tours by appointment as well. Uh, the conservation lab is in the back. It's on a, a sort of addition onto the building. Um, and we have been, because of essentially the Byfield project, um, I've done a, a, a conservation for things on a state and national scale. So it's kind of led to a lot of um, bigger things because once you have the oldest of something in the world, <laughs> or at least in our country, then people start taking notice. Um, our most recent project is uh, the Gettysburg gun. We recently acquired the, or acquired on loan from the state of Rhode Island, the Gettysburg gun from the state house and the Bull Run gun. They're going under renovation and it was the perfect timing for those pieces to come out of the state house where they're directly next to the door anyway. So um, they were constantly getting people touching them. One of the guns was filled with garbage. Um, so now they're um, wrapped in stanchions so that people can't quite walk up to them anymore, but you can still walk fully around them and see all the battle damage original to the guns. So we're very excited about what the Bifo flag has um, led us to in other instances. Um, let's start by um, talking about the history of the Bifo flag. Um, you're looking at Nathaniel Byfield here and uh, Ambrose Burnside. These two gentlemen are the basis for um, what started as what we thought was um, a Burnside flag and not a Byfield flag. 
So we were contacted by the town of Bristol, Rhode Island, and um, a member of the staff there of the town council said, we've got these flags in a cabinet in a closet in our town annex. Can you come look at them? Um, we went down, uh, myself and Patrick Donovan, the curator at the Bar and, and now president of the Barnum Armory, went down there. And um, we pulled, <laughs> this room was not climate controlled at all. I think it was the middle of July. It was so hot, I was sweating profusely just standing there looking at this case, this glass case and this three pane window. Um, so it's getting direct sunlight on it. And inside this case was these flagpoles um, with the flags wrapped up and the flags wrapped in plastic and then taped. Um, so we put some, um, like essentially a sheet on the floor so that we weren't gonna, um, can't contaminate anything on the flags. Um, I cut open some of the plastic so that I could see to the inside and I started to unroll one just a little bit and it was so fragile, it, it almost immediately started shattering because old silk and then sunlight and you know humidity and all that degradation of, over the course of however long it had been in that cabinet just was not treating it very well. But from what we had unrolled, we were, we were suspiciously hopeful that it was one of Ambrose Burnside's flags from uh, the Civil War. Uh, this flag is what we were thinking that it was. We could see a circle of stars, and we could see some kind of a design in the center. But if I had unrolled it anymore, it would have just broken apart. And this is the kind of thing where you need to humidify the flags in order to gently unroll them. And you would only want to unroll it the one time, because every time you manipulate it, you're destroying the flag. So, we contacted the town of Bristol, and we said, hey, we'd love to have these on loan from you. Um, we will uh, look at the flags, unroll them, see if any of them are worth paying for conservation, and if they are, we'll pay for the conservation. So all of your flags will be in climate-controlled storage for free, just loan them to us, and then if anything's worth it, we'll pay for the conservation for it. They liked that idea. <laughs> Um, so we went to a town council meeting and we were actually after the garbage people. They were talking about what size garbage cans they were going to have and they are a rowdy bunch about their garbage. I'm just like, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and they agreed uh, that we would be able to take the flag. So I made these supports that you see here um, so that they could be transported without actually leaning on the fabric at all. And um, we took them out of the building as delicately as we could and laid them in um, his trailer. This is our carpenter, Andy. Um, and then we got to analyze them when they got back to the museum. Um, pardon me, but I realized that they needed to be humidified in order to be unrolled. So we had to create a humidification tent in order for that to be possible. This is Andy's um, handiwork here. Uh, it's a little ghetto, but <laughs> We didn't know what we had at the time, and this is a, a pretty good um, problem-solving technique here. We have a little um, machine that's creating humidity and pumping it into this area. And I left that humidifying for about um, a week before we took the tent off. And then I started cutting open the, um, the flags, the plastic on the flags, and that had to be done one layer at a time because everything was so brittle, even the plastic was degrading. Um, that if I try to uh, cut it any other way, I might just destroy the flags. So one layer at a time, uh, what we thought was seven flags actually turned out to be more like 13. Uh, some of, several of them had been rolled together. And um, we get to this last flagpole, and it's plain and, you know, kind of boring looking. And we're really excited by everything you see stars and we're thinking like that's going to be the really exciting thing that's potentially Burnside's flag um, so we get to this last uh, we get to this last flagpole and I start clipping and I'm realizing this is not like all of these other flags all of these other flags are um, 1800s flags they're made of weighted silk um, the silk is very obvious if you are used to dealing with that kind of fabric. It is, uh, weighted silk is created in a tinning process. It's a six-step wash process where you add metal to the fabric. And even in the time period in the 1800s when they were doing this, they knew that it was degrading to the fabric. They, they had their own skirts falling apart and within you know years, 10 years of having them. So they knew it was bad, but it made such a pretty swishing sound. 
Um, and for flags, that meant it had some more stiffness to it. So you still had the luxury of having a silk flag and the stiffness, right? So even though they knew it was going to degrade, they didn't care as much about the extension of like, who cares, but who's going to worry about this 100 years from now? They were just using it at the time. Um, so we get to this last flag, and it's not weighted silk, which says to me that it's from the 1700s. It's earlier than these other flags. And as I cut to the end of the flagpole, then I see the finial. And the finial says, Captain Nathaniel Byfield, 1687. That's the top image there. And then the one below it is another side. It's a three-sided finial. The next side says, Nathaniel Byfield to the first company of militia. And then the third side says, Bristol for the time being, 1724. <sighs> who? <laughs> we were all very concerned and confused. We had no idea who Nathaniel Byfield was. We were looking for a Burnside flag, so what could this possibly be? Um, so, um, it, we did a little bit of research, but we were essentially um, waiting for uh, what had happened was a PBS uh, person who was, uh, worked for PBS uh, Rhode Island had contacted us, or Rhode Island PBS had contacted us and, and said, we're very interested in what's going on and we'd love to, to video it. So um, we're essentially just waiting for the schedule, uh, viewing the start, and then they'll unroll all these flags on essentially live TV, but not live, right? So they're going to be filming me as I'm unrolling all of these things. And so we did research in between now and then, but essentially a week later I started unrolling flags. And we're thinking, we'll find out about this Nathaniel Byfield fellow later, right? We'll unroll his flag and there'll be something on it and it will help us do research to figure out more about the flag. And in the meantime, we're still looking for something to do with Ambrose Burnside. <laughs> so we unrolled, these are three of the flags, three of the 13. This one is actually very special. This is from the Civil War. It was made in Bristol uh, by the ladies of Bristol. Um, and it had been repaired. You can see this uh, strip at the top. So that was a field repair. This is a flag that was taken out in the first battle. So this was actually in um, Bull Run and several other the first major battles of the Civil War. Um, you can see there's almost no, star, no uh, stripes left on it. Again, weighted silk. Um, and then the canton is made from a silk satin, and that's not weighted, so it actually lasted a lot longer and has held up well. Uh, this is one of the bad post flags from the GAR, uh, Grand Army of the Republic, for uh, its 1880s, 1890s flag. It's one of two, and they all crumpled up. You can see all of these flags have just an astronomical amount of damage to them from the sunlight that they were exposed to over the years. Uh, this is just a sort of side note. You can see how crumpled up one of the Babbitt Post flags was. And I humidified it, I cleaned it. You can see the difference between this and this. Q-tips and spit. <laughs> uh, and a lot of love. Um, and then just realigning everything up, I um, created this backing for it. And it has a glue that can actually be undone. It, you just uh, reheat it and it will very gently you peel it back off. All conservation work is stuff that you can undo. So you don't do anything that you can't undo. Um, you don't want to cause irrevocable damage to the objects. So um, re um, adhered this down so that it had more stability to it. All the numbers and letters were all curling up. And then this is the finished product here. So um, like I said, PBS came and filmed this at the armory. Um, this is the, the bifold flag laid out. Um, and they decided that they were going to do um, a show about Byfield because suddenly we didn't have a Burnside flag anymore. We had this really cool thing <laughs> that uh, was actually even more special. So getting to the actual conservation. We laid out the flag and we were kind of actually disappointed. There's nothing on it. There's just this gold flag. It doesn't have anything in a canton in the corner, which is usually what you see the stars, blue stars with the white field, uh, blue field with the white stars that we have for our American flag. That's a canton. There's no stripes. There's no painting. There's nothing on it. Um, so we were actually kind of disappointed at first um, until we learned that the Venn system for the time for flags, V-E-N-N -N system, was a, um, I think it's the next slide. There we go was um, for a colonel to have a solid, but, but this is a British um, setup, I unfortunately don't have uh, the American one, I couldn't find it available, it was only in a book. 
um, that we've taken a picture of. Uh, but so the, the vet system is to have a solid red flag for American colonels. This is the British system, so this has a blue flag for colonels. So this was alleged originally red. <laughs> And once I heard that research, I was like, okay, well, let me look around and see if I can find anything on the fly that would point to it having been red. And in fact, it does not show up quite so well in your picture. I can see it better in mine on, on the computer here. The tassels underneath uh, the outside here is all red wool on the underside. There's, uh, once we took the pole out of the sleeve, you could see through the whole sleeve was still red on the inside. And around the outside in the fringe, there were still areas of red. And then also where the, the pole had, the finial had pinched the fabric at the top of the pole, there was a, a chunk of red fabric that still remained and hadn't been changed. And so I had to do some research, but I found out that the way that they dyed um, red, the, they got the scarlet color red that they were looking for in, the, uh, in, the, in that time period was they would dye it gold, which was a much cheaper dye, because they were all natural dyes, right? And then they would over dye it in cochineal, which was much more expensive red. And then instead of getting a dull kind of crayon red, you got this beautiful scarlet red when you did this technique. Now the trouble with that is that silk is gonna absorb all the gold and the red is sort of sitting on top of it. So even by the time that, um, this is one of the flags that they took, in, uh, the Bristol Rhode Island took in their 4th of July parade. It's the longest running 4th of July parade. And they took it in their parade from, I believe, the 1830s until the 1876, when somebody broke the flagpole and they had to have it repaired. Um, and what the wonderful gentleman that broke up, that would repaired it actually wrote on the repair that he'd done that he'd done it on July 4th, 1876. Very helpful. I love it when people do that. <laughs> um, so we started out with this bare flag. We did all this research, research. We found that, yes, it used to be red. And then we actually further did testing later to prove that, yes, it did have cochineal dye on it, and it was red. Um, so then what did we do? The first steps for conservation are that I have to clean it first. So it's been around for 328 years since Nathaniel Blackfield bought his stand of colors in 1695. Um, so it's seen a thing or two. It's got some dirt on it. Um, as it was sitting in the closet, it also acquired some little buggy friends. So this is a moth casing left over. Um, thankfully, the moth didn't seem to like that flag so much and went after the other ones more. Um, so it was a lot of cleaning things like this off. And slowly vacuuming, I put a screen down and I would um, cover my hand over the end of a vacuum and you could feel the dust particles hitting my hand as it's sucking them up on a very low pressure. And once I stopped feeling those particulates, the, the particles, the dust hitting my hand anymore and going into the vacuum, I knew that I cleaned as much as I could on that area. Uh, then we got to do the most nail biting thing with the flag, which was to flip it over so I could clean the other side. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> that was terrifying. We have all these loose bits, <laughs> and it was very worrisome about whether something was going to come apart. But we managed it. Um, and then the next step is the humidification process. So you can see how wrinkly it was beforehand. Um, then we did a, when I say we, I should say me, uh, royal we. <laughs> I did a, a cold humidification uh, process where um, you put a uh, moist blotting paper underneath the flag and then put a layer of uh, something that's akin to uh, your ski jackets if you go skiing or if you're out in the snow it will allow you to your your sweat to breathe out of your body but it doesn't allow snow or moisture or anything into the fabric so it allowed the moisture from the blotting paper to go up to the fabric but not the actual droplets of water which was the key uh, so I created this sort of little tent in little squares about the size of the um, where I was vacuuming so about that big and one section at a time, just slowly with glass weights, weighted down each section and realigned all the fibers until we have what you see here, which is as flat as it could humanly be. Um, and from the whole process, we did find this um, suspicious brown spot in the corner, uh, which we suspected to be blood, but we couldn't prove. Um, so we call it our suspicious jam spot or, or uh, jelly or something to that effect. Um, so because we had that spot, we suspected that it was blood, and also that we wanted to prove the flag was in fact red, aside from all the little spots that had red on it beforehand. 
we contacted the Smithsonian and said, hey, do you want to test the oldest flag in America? And they said, oh yeah. <laughs> so um, I sent off a blood sample and then some uh, fabric uh, pieces that had come off of the flag to use um, for dye testing for reds, various reds, and then various yellows. And it did come back as positive for cochineal. So we do know that the flag was red for sure. Um, and the blood sample unfortunately came back inconclusive. And the brain shooks. <laughs> so um, thankfully, uh, through other friends of history, the Society of Colonial Wars uh, heard about the flag and decided to donate the money necessary to have it conserved and mounted. Uh, we needed to create a table for it. The materials for conservation and archival quality materials are very expensive, um, so we were very grateful to them for supplying the funds for that. Um, so now it's been flattened, and then I need to go and get a uh, layer to keep all those broken bits from coming up off the flag. This had to fit out the door that was a human-sized door, and it's about four foot by five foot, so it wasn't going to do that without having to tip up. So I had to be able to hold the fabric down, and I decided that a silk crepeline cover over top of it, which is a very thin silk fabric, dyed to match the flag, would be the most innocuous, but also keep everything tacked down and keep it from moving over time. Because we wanted to keep this flag laid flat. We didn't want to have it be something that you put on a wall that puts a lot of stress on the material, and that's when you start losing pieces over time and they fall down. Um, in order for this to last for as many centuries to come as it, we hope it will, we wanted to keep it flat. So I contacted Dr. Martin Bai at the University of Rhode Island. He had a dye department and he was exceptionally good at um, matching materials. You, this is not a backfill flag, but this is him matching uh, Union Blue for me, which is an exceptionally hard shade of blue to match for some other Civil War uniforms that I was working on. What I essentially did was I found a paint color swatch that matched the flag as best as I could because I wasn't taking the flag to the University of Rhode Island to have a match. And he used the paint chip essentially as this is being used for this machine to, as accurately as possible, go through all of the dyes that exist in the world and to pop out a, a set of numbers and say, this is the dyes that you'll put together and you'll get the exact, exact like, right color to um, cover that flag. We then put the fabric, the silk crinkling, not this. <laughs> So quickly into this little dye bath, and it popped out with the perfect um, uh, color. Um, so it created this silk crepe lane fabric, and you can see how it just blends right in over top of it. You can you can only see that it's there because of the edges right there. I'm gonna skip back. So the next nail biting thing before I put that silk crepe lane on was that I had to transfer this to a mount that I had made so that I could stitch it down around the edges and hold it in place and it could be moved on the mat and then it's not just a floppy piece of fabric. So, um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when you hang something like a flag, you usually end up, as soon as you hang it, it starts to pull and the one long corner just gets longer and longer and it's not really square anymore once you uh, lay it back out flat. And that's the way that this flag was. It was sort of cattywampus, and I couldn't quite get it to go back to any kind of square. Um, so what I did was I measured it, and I figured out some landmark points on the mount that I wanted to put it on to sort of, I made it a little bit crooked so that it wouldn't look as crooked as it was in real life. Um, and I kind of had the one shot to lay it out and have it come up right. So I wrapped it in this holly text that you're seeing here on both sides, and kind of like um, sticky wallpaper where you have that layer that you pull off the underside as you're putting it down, I was pulling off the under layer and the over layer. So moved it with the holly text and then pulled out the under layer and just sort of gently laid it out until the fabric was on top of the mount. I don't have a, I, there is film of it, but they didn't put it <laughs> in the thing, so I can't show it to you. Hopefully that made sense to you though. Um, and thankfully it did all get laid out um, perfectly on the first go because the stuff is sort of like Velcro. As soon as it touches something, it wants to hold on to it. Um, so I wasn't going to get more than one chance. Um, so there you can see the silk crepe lane I was tacking to the outside of the mount here. And then I stitched it down around the outside to keep it all tacked in place. And the last thing to do was to comb the fringe literally one strand at a time with a very fine uh, metal spatula 
It took me 15 hours to comb every strand because they were all individually knotted. And I discovered a couple of cool things. I found one spot where there was another chunk where the, all the fringe had been knotted together for so long that there was a chunk of red still in the fringe. And um, I discovered that the um, way that they made this was they would loop it through the silk, sort of a band at the top of the fringe. It would come down, it would loop, and then it would go back up. So there's some of these longer pieces where areas where they hadn't quite cut all the fringe perfectly, so there were still loops or some areas that were longer than others. So you're just sort of seeing the manufacturing technique of how they did the fringe at the time, which I think is pretty cool. So. We thought we were done. We did this, we had this lovely table made, but then we had, uh, were contacted by, or um, came into contact with this gentleman here who had an XRF machine. Um, and actually, I think I went to a conference and I saw him and I said, hey, <laughs> I have a fun project for you if you want to cover in your hundreds of thousands of dollar machinery to the armory. And he did, he brought his XRF machine and he tried to test the blood. It came back inconclusive. It came back for protein fiber, but the silk is made of protein fiber, so you can't necessarily say that that's blood, unfortunately. Um, but it was very lovely of him to come and give, us a, give it a try. Um, and so there became a uh, um, PBS special about the whole project, and I'm just going to play this clip for you. Hopefully nothing loops and gets mad at me. It's funny and interesting how memories are forgotten and then recovered. Oh, it's, 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 it's playing for me and not you, and I don't know why. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> There's a preview. It's also on Rhode Island's PBS website. If you go to their website, you can see the video if you haven't seen it yet. It's very lovely. Oh, now, really? Aha, okay. <laughs> so, the Blackfield Plank, like I said, has sort of led us to other um, really amazing opportunities. Not only did we get the Gettysburg gun recently from the State House, but um, we also, because of that, we're in talks with the State House about the two Revolutionary War era flags that they have in their collection from Rhode Island. And Re Re Revolutionary War era flags are uh, um, very few and far between in general. I think there's only like 13 or 12, 13 or 20, some, some, some number very low left in, um, for, of all Revolutionary War era flags. And we have two of them in our uh, collection, which is really wonderful. Uh, there's the Rhode Island Regiment, and then there's the 1st Regiment uh, flag. There were two regiments in Rhode Island, um, and then they sort of combined down into the Rhode Island Regiment, which is this one here. So um, we're in contact with them and working on getting a loan so that going so that we can hopefully have these conserved for the Revolutionary War era um, anniversary, for the 250th anniversary coming up. Um, so we're hoping to have this one, and then the National Army Museum is hoping to have this one tomorrow. So Rhode Island is kind of, uh, you know, the biggest small state that there is. We have a lot of history, and some of it's in closets, and some of it's in drawers. And as we find it and discover it and, and can show it off, it becomes uh, even more amazing uh, to all the other states. Neater, 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 we're cooler. <laughs> and that's essentially my whole uh, spiel, if anyone has any questions. So these are um, in control of the state. So the state has them in storage in a place in Massachusetts. Um, they were hanging at the state house behind the Gettysburg gun and the Bull Run gun. Um, and then they realized, I believe in 2016, that they were degrading very badly. And so they um, put forth a contract, a 10-year contract, to have them um, stabilized, so essentially taken off of their flagpoles. You can see that this has like this weird border around the outside. There's actually a mesh fabric um, along the whole flag on both sides, and somebody in the probably 1960s thought it was a great idea to do a zigzag stitch on a machine, like a sewing machine, oh, wow. and just go through all the layers. So all these sort of, you sort of see a texture to it. Those are all stitched zigzag lines going across diagonally. And I actually, I saw these flags in person, and you can kind of see it here, how there's these folds going across it. That does not line up with those stitching. That's where she rolled the flag on each side in order to be able to get to the center, because it's too big. So she rolled it up, 
you know, on both sides with this mesh over top of it on both sides, and then started her stitching and like went to the outside. And so those four inch folds are just absolutely destroyed the flag. So you know, something that lasted for 200 years, it only took 50 years to really destroy. Um, I mean, a lot of these were gone. You can see this whole side is essentially gone before she even started, but it's just, it's really rough. So um, it's actually my professional opinion that they can't really be unstitched without doing exceptional damage to them. So it's kind of, that's the way that they are. Um, and it's more about cleaning them, stabilizing them, and um, potentially putting a layer underneath it so that you can see the fill-in. We can um, do a sort of paint underneath to give you the idea of what the whole flag would have looked like. Um, and so that's, that's the goal, is we think we leave them like they are because we don't want to make that worse, and then um, fill in the under spot. So, yes? So the bifield flag dates from 1695. And what exactly was it used for? So it could have been used for the Queen Anne's War, or it could have been used for, um, oh gosh, there's one coming right after it. It wasn't the Indian War, it was um, Queen Anne or, oh God, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking. There's one that came right after Queen Anne's War. Um, so we think it either went up to New Hampshire or Maine on one of those. Um, Queen George's War? George, there we go. Um, and so we think it either went up to one of those states. So we know that the flag was used by the militia um, and it was sent either there or um, to Yes? So Marie, last time you, you talked about this, you talked about where you think this was made, et cetera. Oh, okay. Um, and so, let's go back. So um, we have this large piece of uh, silk and it's got the seam down the middle and it's all hand stitched. Um, so what I kept thinking was, where did this come from? 1695, we didn't make our own silk at the time. So um, either this fabric would have had been purchased and then created into a flag over here in um, Bristol, Rhode Island, potentially, or it was purchased as a flag, but if it was purchased as a flag, at that time period, it would have had been purchased from either um, London or France because those are two uh, hubs of silk manufacture at the time, and it's more likely to have come from France because they had better known silk uh, dealers, and all those people that knew how to make silk were sort of being forced to stay in France and make silk for the state of the country. So um, it's more likely to have come from France than it is London. Um, so either we bought the silk from them and ordered a standard colonel's flag in uh, American colors, which would have been red, or um, we ordered some red silk and then had it manufactured over here. And I was talking to another expert of um, historic uh, flags and military um, wares, and he said that the fringe isn't something that would have been put on a flag at that time. Um, so we aren't sure. I would like to carbon date. That's the other, another testing thing I'd like to do is I'd like to carbon date the fringe as compared to the flag and see if they both come back to a similar time period. You're going to get a date range, but I would just like to know whether the fringe was original and it's just a flag that had fringe on it at the time, um, or if it was sort of added to you know spruce it up in the 1800s when they were taking it through the um, Fourth of July parades. Um, so that's a fun thing I'm not uh, quite sure about there. Um, but yeah, so we either think that the flag was manufactured um, overseas and then sent over here, or that we purchased the silk and then manufactured it over here. Yes? What's the oldest silk known to be in the world? So before this flag, uh, in America at least, the oldest flag beforehand was the Bedford flag in Bedford, Massachusetts. And it's a, sort of a picture of a, an arm um, making a muscle. Um, and I think there's like a crown on it. And that was made, they think, in 1825. Uh, I apologize, 1725. Um, so it would have been, um, you know, this is essentially 30 years older than that flag. And we had a baby to them. <laughs> and we tried to make it gently. <laughs> but it, even this flag is the oldest until something else is found. Um, I do believe there was another, uh, like, a very small fragment of a flag that was potentially older than this flag, um, but we, uh, we try to, I think that was in New Mexico or uh, something like that, but we try to validate this by saying it's the oldest whole flag in America, as opposed to 
versus some, I think it's a four inch fragment of a flag. I wouldn't call that a flag person, but you know. How about other countries? I am not a flag expert, unfortunately. I'm not a vexologist, but um, I know that Europe has gads of older things than this. So I would say that they probably have a flag that's older than this. So we just say that this is the oldest either colonial American flag or oldest coal flag in America. It was pretty stunning to survive, though. Oh my goodness. And just the fact, so you got to imagine, so this thing got made in 1695 at some point and then was used by the militia company. They, they literally went off to war with it, brought it back, and then put it in a closet somewhere, you know, or on display somewhere in some town hall or something until uh, Nathaniel Byfield in 1724 essentially donated it to the town. He's like, I'm heading out. I bought this thing, but you can have it now. It was from the first company of militia, and he was being captain. I don't think I ever explained that. I apologize. I wasn't looking at my notes. Um, he was made captain in 1687, and then he became colonel in 1694, and then he bought his own stand of colors in 1695, which is this flag, stand of colors. Um, and so, you know, it went off to war, it came back, it um, sat in some closet for a while, it was flown in the 4th of July parades at the front of the parade. There were news articles that literally said, the, the Byfield flag is looking a, a little uh, dull. And then uh, one later in, in the 1800s said, um, I think they've replaced it with another flag because the color is not the same, right? So you can literally see as they were documenting it, as they were talking about it in their own 4th of July parade, that it, it was being, the bread was falling off of it. Um, so uh, so it, it went through all those 4th of July parades. The, the finial was broken off and 1876, and then they repaired it, and I think that they, I, there's no other documentation of them this, um, flying it in their 4th of July parade or carrying it in their 4th of July parade um, for the next however many years. Um, in 1884, we know that it was put in this closet in the annex town hall, uh, it, which is called the Burnside Building, and then it sat there on display in the, in the flag closet for uh, another 100 years until about the 1980s when the town council was like, ooh, those flags are falling apart, we should do something about that. And they wrapped them in plastic and taped them. And then they thought about what they'd do with it, but it was in the building next door to them and the people change over and you lose that institutional knowledge and everybody forgets until that one last person's there. He's like, I think there's important flags in that closet, we should do something about this before I retire because I'm the last person to know about it and then he contacts us, and then we find it and put it on display and found this amazing piece of history, but if it didn't have a finial on it, we wouldn't even know what it was. So there's just so much about chance and fate to happen for this flag to even survive. It was at the back of the closet with several other flags in front of it, as you saw, and that's the only reason I think that it survived at all, is because there was so much insulating it from the direct sunlight of all the other flags. So. Crazy. <laughs> yes? So how many hours do you have in this project, roughly? So it's just the fringe to be 15 hours. Um, I'm probably up near 60 or 70, I would probably say. Um, it definitely it took a long time to humidify it to figure out the safest process for doing that. You have to sort of go, I have these tiny little tiles of uh, glass that are an uh, inch and a half by four inches and I was laying those down and shifting fabric and trying not to pinch it and going as gently as possible. And that took forever. Vacuuming it took forever. <laughs> so yeah, I think I'm 50 to 60 hours into this project. That's incredible. Thank I you. Just in, please forgive me, but that's astounding. Oh, thank, thank you. you for your hard work. Absolutely. Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you so much for coming to my uh, talk and listening to the process. It's a sort of a behind the scenes thing that nobody gets to see me really do. So it's kind of fun to talk about it and hear people so interested. Thank you for sharing. Maria, you, you get all of our goodies. Oh, do. <laughs> our Battle of Rhode Island cat. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> our Battle of Rhode Island Battle Brew. Ooh. Yay. Battle <laughs> Brew. <laughs> Good. And then our first three coins, oh, wow. which are the uh, 
Wow. Butsell Ford, the 250th, and Robert Terry. Oh, wow. And then our most recent. Oh, wow. Clear Scott. Yay. Put my coffee in there. So thank you very much. Thank you.